Hello, and welcome to the commentary, the video commentary for Goblin, issue 13A. <laughs> I'm Solomon Mars, uh, creator of the series. So um, let's just jump right into it, because uh, this cover is really boring. Well, I've said a million times before, I'm really bad at doing covers, and um, I don't know. Well, I won't say really bad at doing covers, but... It just, it's hard to depict uh, the interior of the comic in um, the exterior of the book. And that's just a uh, credits page or a, co uh, co um, yeah, credits page. Um, so, yeah, issue 13A picks up, you know, Shadow Sunset um, picks up. We're picking up after the events of, uh, what is it, 12, 11, 10, 9, and 8 when, you know, the Red Castle story arc. Um, and, um, we're kind of seeing here, uh, that Reduha is packing up, you know, as ordered by, uh, Charlon, the rock eater, in the last issue. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff happened. Mumu was kidnapped, and, uh, they just, they, they ran into some, uh, some, some serious trouble. Um, in that last one, hold on, I'm sorry. <laughs> 12 was still open in the background um, and um, so now they're actually setting off on their adventure to track down and get Mumu back um, and I, I really wanted to I, di I did all this to show some other ways that logic can be used um, you know using different incantations the type of incantations that uh, the Rock Eater can do, and obviously has passed on to Riduha. Um, and I just thought it was kind of, you know, interesting to show different different ways that logic can be used. It's not just for attacking, you know, it's not just for fighting and stuff. Uh, you see, like, uh, the Rock Eater here actually doing, this is one of the things that people, this is why she is so well known in the Red Castle, is that she does a lot of repair work using her logic, you know, and using this particular form of, uh, of um, incantations, you know, where she's using the ink and stuff, and she's writing out the incantations directly on the material, uh, and she's mending all, all of the, the entire steam hall that was torn up between the, in the fight between um, Reduha and 26, and earlier Reduha, 26, and Amy, um, and... Um, you know, she's getting help from the people, and, you know, they, I mean, that's why they, they like her so much. They really appreciate what she's doing. Um, <clears throat> and then I show, you know, Jeff returning um, the stamp back to um, Frez? Was his name Fez or was it Frez? I believe it was Frez because I didn't want it to be Fez, um, <clears throat> which is the name of, like, an old character of my friend, of an old friend of mine. Uh, so I made it, you know, different. Not that he, he would care. Anyways, <laughs> um, I will say that one of the things I, I, I remember that uh, confused some people was the fact that there were these word balloons here that were popping up and they were they were not attached. They didn't have the little, the, the tails. So it was like you could hear, it was talking, people talking. And, and what it was was, you know, I didn't, I, on, I honestly often don't think about whether or not people can interpret certain narrative devices the same way that I interpret them. Uh, with this series, I play a lot with time, and, and not like time, I don't mean like time travel, although there is a little bit of that. Um, <clears throat> uh, but I mostly, I play with the concept of, you know, day-to-day -day time, you know, if this event happened, you know, hours back in the past, hours ahead, you know, compared to contemporary time. And, um, I do that a lot, sort of, uh, without explaining it, you know, and I, th I think I've, I mentioned it in an in a earlier commentary that I don't like, uh, I don't like, at least for this series, I don't like those uh, very typically comic book narrative devices, such as narration boxes. I don't want a narration box sitting up in the corner and saying, meanwhile, or, you know, uh, three hours ago. You know, I don't want that because I feel like it does for me at least. And I assume that for some other people, it, it pulls them out of the experience. You know, it pulls them out of the immersiveness of the story. And um, 
Yeah, I know I've mentioned this before. I definitely mentioned this before. But um, I know there are plenty of comics that don't do it. And there, you know, there are people that are like strong, strong advocates for that old school uh, sort of storytelling. And I don't know. There's just sometimes, sometimes there's a place for it, and sometimes there's not. It depends on the story, really. And Goblin is not that kind of story. It, it's a story where you're you're less an omniscient being reading someone else's life, more than I want it to be like you sort of being there when it's happening. You're experiencing it at the same time that the characters are experiencing it. And this is one of those odd sort of narrative devices that I like, which works much better in film than it does in comics because, you know, the way that we associate the visuals and the text, um, it's that, you know, flashback with a narration over it. And, you know, you hear the characters talking while we're seeing the events leading up to their, their where they are currently. And, um, again, this is me just messing around with, uh, with sort of the Amy character showing how sad she is and stuff. You see uh, Jeff sort of responding to that. Um, somebody did comment on this where you see Jeff put his arm around Amy. Uh, and mentioned, yeah, well, he is growing up. And, yes, he is. You can't help it. I mean, he's he's been in contact with Amy for so long. He's starting to he, can, he kind of understands that. You know, he does. He understands that a little bit. Um, the loss. He understands loss. Um, uh, let's see. And um, oh, and the guy finding the thing. He finds uh, this this blade and I always forget the name of that blade it's a very specific type of blade I always forget but it's not it's not important right now um, yeah but uh it's just it's really just catching up it's a it's a slight time skip it's very slight because it's only like the course of maybe a day a day and a half it's a very slight time skip I don't know if I actually say how long it's been but um I can't remember at this point. <laughs> That's sad, you know, not being able to remember uh, what what was said in the dialogue. And I don't feel like sitting here and reading as I'm going. Um, I'm just going to talk about, like, the things that I was thinking about while I was doing the book, you know, when I developed it. Um, and this is just showing... Uh, this technically is kind of the same logic that ha that gives the, uh, the Okio... The ability, like when Jeff first pulled the Okio out of his pocket and he put it on the on the on the counter at the slug hut, and it 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 tripled in size and it just kind of grew up to a, a normal size book. This is the same kind of logic that's being used, except it's being used exterior of the books versus you know her sitting and scribbling it on each of the books. Because I mean the the the, the difference between um, an Okio and this is that the Okio is sort of their version of it's it's technology it's their 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 version of technology and what's going on is that it has a relay inside of it you know the 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 um invocachim invocachin stamp that's in there it's that triangular stamp that's inside the book uh and I, I guess I'll have to go ahead and actually update the 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 goblin data book on the website so that I talk a little bit more about that um the invocachin on the interior of the book has a it's a relay it's a constant relay uh not just for tra it's you know for updating the book it transmits uh you know updated data to uh the pages in inside the book but it also relays information to the to the book you know it, it creates this same sort of uh incantation so that the book can shrink or grow you know um and uh you know, in order for her to do that, she would have to put the incantation on the interior of each of the books so that each one shrinks. And then later, in order to get the books back to their regular size, she'd have to wipe off all the incantations and uh, put in a new incantation to restore them to their normal size. Not Wiping them off wouldn't be enough to restore it to its normal size. It would stay what size it already is, you know. Um, 
which is it, it's it's slightly contradictory to you know how incantations work because you can you know you can break some incantations by destroying them you know um, uh, like the incantations in the um, in the old Doma of Enlightenment that Amy and Jeff came across back in issue four I believe it was yeah issue four um, where some of the incantations had been destroyed and so the the strength of the incantations were weak and Amy could feel that and Jeff couldn't really but Sankofa could as well and they knew they were weak but they could they could feel it they could hear it it was like they could hear it um, and uh, it's slightly contradictory to that but destroying an incantation doesn't necessarily destroy the effects 100% especially in this kind of case you know where you're you're uh, changing the um, the actual information of the object you're, you're changing the object in a way uh, we're not just talking about like the incantation in that domo was to seal something in you know it was to seal an object in and um, that was it was a logic artifact to seal in on top of the logic artifact being the thing that sealed in that that particular spirit um, or whatever it was in there was also to well what it was was <laughs> was unlimited ninety nine um, shows up later sorry uh, getting ahead of myself but um you know it's it's uh, not only to, you know to just not I mean the logic artifact seals it in but then you know you build on top of that if it's particularly strong um, if the thing that's been put into the uh, the logic artifact is is strong like an element eater is strong. Uh, so, yeah, you know, you would have to. And I, I am getting ahead of myself, so let me stop talking about that. Um, getting many, many issues ahead of myself. Um, so we're finally going to catch up to right now, and they're discussing, they've got their, their backpacks. And I love, I love backpacks, you know, and stuff, and uh, they're so uncomfortable to carry, though. I've, I've gone uh, hiking in the mountains and stuff, uh, in the mountains in North Carolina, before with friends uh and um yeah they're they're kind of they're kind of uncomfortable if it's not something that you do all the time and it wasn't something i did all the time and so you know but i i, I like that being an element in a story because you know you sometimes see these adventures where characters go off on these long treks and they never take stuff with them you know and it's just like you know, I, I didn't want, you know, the char the characters of the story to always have to, they, they're going to inns. You know, they stop at a town and they, they can pay for an inn and they sleep in beds and stuff like that. I don't like that sort of t storytelling in my story because, in my stories, because it's, it's too convenient. That's not the way that it can always be, uh, especially in a world like this where, I mean, these guys don't have a lot of money. They actually don't have any money. <laughs> Not really. Uh, they have a little bit of money. Each of them probably has a little bit of money. I, I assume that uh, the Rock Eater probably has the most money out of all of them. Um, but she usually takes her money and she gives it right back to the community. So she doesn't have a lot of money. Um, and uh, so they're not going to run around find the, lo the, the closest town and sleep at an inn or a hotel or something like that. They don't need a bed. Um, they're very, uh, I don't know what you call, what is that term? Outdoorsy, you know? I, I, there's a term for the kind of people that go out and uh, rough it, you know, um, in amongst nature. Um, but that's the kind of, you know, that's what they are. You know I mean? That, that, that's what, uh, being a logic smith kind of is about you know you you sort of you know you're adaptable and in, in many ways you know you have to have that sort of adaptability um and yeah that's and and you know that's part of why i wanted to introduce the character of uh uh the rock eater charlon into the situation into the sort of the dynamic you know of these characters was because she adds sort of that sort of old school um, sensibility, you know, how logics used to work before Jeff was born and when she was a little girl is that, you know, they didn't, they did not accept for the most part the conveniences of the contemporary world, the modern world. They 
were naturalists. They went out and they, they, you know, they roughed it. They lived off the land. You know, they, you know, they didn't bring uh, um, packs of dehydrated food with them. They went and they scrounged and they found their food, you know, in the ground. Or, you know, they, they located, they had to learn how to uh, identify edible plants and things like that. You know, um, you know. Uh, real foragers, <laughs> and uh, you know, and that's what she's she's sort of that. You know, she's there for that reason, and uh, she, in, even in this part, she's she's kind of being that to Jeff. She's talking about tracking people, you know, especially you know, like a logic smith, um, <clears throat> having needing the ability to do this, um, and uh, she's showing him. I love. I actually like this. You know, she's showing her ability as a tracker, um, and. It's also a way of explaining to uh, readers how the, what the, how the environment is. You know, I, I, I don't know if everyone who reads the book has, been, has witnessed a lot of the conditions that are being presented in every issue, you know, as far as the environments. But I figure, you know, most of us, you know, we're, we're, we know what uh, squishy land is like. You know, sometimes you... After after a long rain or several days of rain, you walk through the grass and the ground is really soft. Even though it's grass, you know there's you know there's soil right underneath it. There's there's it's sort of the ground isn't muddy, but it's really soft, and so your foot sort of sinks in. But the grass doesn't uh, break up to where you can see the mud underneath. But it's still your foot sort of sinks in a little. Um, and that's what this whole area is like because it's right next to this river, so the ground is really moist. And she's pointing out the fact that Sapphire didn't take this into account. She didn't hide her tracks. Um, if she had been thinking about it, but she was so panic-stricken, and that's what, what she's pointing out is that she was so panic-stricken that she didn't take precautions. You know, she's she's because she's... Uh, um, because part of her logic ability, she can kind of control electricity to a point, uh, static electro electrical discharge. She is uh, sort of frayed, you know, she's a little, yeah, you know, and so she's sort of letting off this electrical discharge, even though she's running through the woods, it's still kind of frying all the surrounding stuff and she's leaving footprints. Honestly, if she had thought about it, she would have done what, what they did in an earlier, in the earlier issue, which I think was like a, around 11A or 11B or something like that. Uh, maybe, 11A or 11B, where they were inside um, the Red Castle and they were jumping across the pillars. They were, um, what is that called? It's called, um, I forget what it's called. <laughs> um, but uh, it's it's a form of repelling. Um, they're going back and forth. I forget what that term is called. But uh, uh, she would have done that through the trees. She would have just you know, clung to the, the trees and just kind of moved through the treetops, or not the treetops, but uh, uh, close to the treetops, so that, you know, she was more untraceable, you know, to people down on the ground. But she, you know, she was panicked, so she didn't think about that kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, I love that. In focus, out of focus. <laughs> that one took a little bit of work because I didn't, uh, I, had, I think I, drew, I had to draw that on several sheets, the background is, you know, was was a picture all its own. The middle ground with the character was a picture all its own, and then the foreground was. Um, I do that sometimes, but sometimes it's difficult because I forget to scan a page, and then I'll look at them and I'm like, what is, what was I doing? Um, or I'll forget to put it on separate sheets, and then I'll, I'll come to that page and I'll realize, oh man, some of that needs to be in the background. It needs to be out of focus in the background, and, I, and I'll have to go in into Photoshop. And manipulate the actual image and sometimes it comes out good sometimes it doesn't um, I have by this point I had sort of gotten into the into sort of the, the um, routine of creating uh, if they're going if characters are going to be in an environment for an extended period of time then I created a set of generic or not I guess generic isn't the word but um, backgrounds that could be um, could be used over and over and over, and in different ways. You know, I would change the size, you know, the scale of it, 
blur it in, to different degrees. But I would use, you know, like the same three or four backgrounds over and over again, uh, just so that the the back behind the characters it wasn't just blank. You know, which sometimes I do, but that's usually as sort of an emotional cue. It's it's sort of to to play up the emotional state that the characters are in. But then you have like conversational scenes like this, and you can't just have empty space behind the characters like this one. Yeah, it's it's the color. You know, I'm using the color, but it's the same color that's playing off the colors of the landscape behind them. But um, also, it would have been really, really, it'd have been over intense if I had put a background in here, even if I blurred it, it would have been distracting for these characters in such a close-up. Um, and again, like I was saying in, uh, in, the, in the previous issue's commentary, this is one of those, this is one of those um, situations where Jeff was being compared to someone else, and he was dealing with that. And here, it's, he's being sort of compared to Reduha, who is a much more... Um, attentive student than Jeff was. Jeff kind of doesn't care about logic. He really, he kind of doesn't care. Reduha wants to learn logic. He, he wants to learn as much as he can. He really enjoys uh, the Rock Eater being his, his, his teacher. He really enjoys the things that he's learning. And, um, and, and this, you know, and you can kind of see that. I don't think I did, there's no, I don't think there's a reaction from Jeff in this. There should have been a reaction scene from Jeff. That would have been much better if there was a reaction scene from Jeff. But that's also not a story. That's not a plot line to the story. You know, you don't see a conflict really between uh, Jeff and Reduha. Um, at least not now. <laughs> uh, that's a bit of a spoiler. Um, future spoiler. Uh, you don't. But so I decided. I guess I just decided not to focus on it. But um, I did like this, where they're they're sort of sitting around in the uh, in the middle of the forest, and they're using this stone this, with these crystals that glow uh, at dusk and through the night. They sort of let off. It's not an intense glow. It's not like it's not like a fire. Like and that's that's the thing. You know, they couldn't light a fire. They um, and they don't talk about it. But you don't if you're tracking someone, you don't light a fire because there's a, there's a very good chance that maybe they've taken a rest and they may accidentally spot the smoke from your fire or if it's dark enough they may actually see your fire because they may they may not be too far from you and so they might see the light from your fire or they may if it's still if it's still light enough they might see the smoke rising from your fire and so you know you have to take those things into account so they used this particular crystal that doesn't let off too much of a glow but um yeah and you know we got the conflict between uh, Jeff and his his grandmother, uh, and she's trying to convince him that you know they're not they're not bad people, uh, they're not bad. The uh, the um, this organization, which I don't know if it had been named at this point, but it's it's uh, it's Aburoso, um, the tree of Aburoso, uh, and yeah, they they're sort of lawlessness. You know, they're they're lawless. I mean, uh, they work outside of any government that's there and it's it's funny to see Jeff kind of thinking about this sort of thing for me it's kind of funny because Jeff I wouldn't say that Jeff works outside of any form of government or law he, he doesn't care he just kind of roams freely he doesn't he's not he's not uh, he has no um, loyalty as a citizen to any one region his hometown was destroyed so he has no loyalty uh, as far as a citizen to any one area, any kingdom or anything, um, I do regret not really talking a lot about the different kingdoms and their and the way that their governments work and stuff. But um, at least I regret not talking about it early on. But there's plenty of time to talk about it later. Uh, a lot of stuff happens with those things later on in the series. Um, I do like the fact that he talks about cities. He doesn't like cities. He doesn't like cities, um, and that's that's more so a reflection of me. I'm not big on cities; they are crazy. Cities are crazy. Um, a lot of people go through that that uh, <laughs> phase, I guess. Um, 
a lot of people go through that phase where they want to move to the to the to a big city or something, and uh, live in the city. One, it's expensive. Um, I've known several people that have lived in a city. One, it's expensive, and two, cities are crazy. They are filled with chaos. Um, they really are. It's just it's chaos incarnate, and I don't mean like crime or anything. It's just. It's the absolute movement, the consistent movement. There's always movement in a city. It's always alive. There's always something going on. There's a million people. And it's very frustrating for me, you know, to go in there because into a city and, and look around at all this chaos. There are people driving in cars. There are people walking around. And then, yes, you, I mean, you have lots and lots of inconsiderate people. Um, but that's sort of, you know, that's sort of a broad sort of, uh, 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 sort of judgmental way of looking at it. You know, it's very, it's, it's a stereotype of, you know, people being rude in a city, but I've been in, in the interior of a lot of big cities and, uh, it, you get a lot of people that they're, they're so busy, you know, they're so busy and they're shuffling around so much that, um, they don't have time to be courteous. They don't have time to be considerate. They don't have time to care about what another person is doing. Uh, they're just trying to get from point A to point B and uh, the fastest way possible. Um, there is a, a, there's a, a, an era of immediacy to a city that creates sort of this, this thick layer of chaos, you know, and, and, and you just feel it. You get into the heart of a city and you just feel it. And for me, it just doesn't feel good. It's very weird. I, I'm not saying I like the country. Um, it's a little too quiet in the country. Uh, I'm sort of, I'm, you know, I, I've always lived in areas just outside of the city, you know, and in the, in the suburban areas just out of, outside of cities because it's calm enough, you know. Um, and that's more so what Jeff is used to. You know, that, that, that part of me exists in Jeff in that part of his character is that um, he's just, he, he likes that sort of that middle ground. Um, yeah, and this is Jeff. He's just being really accusatory, you know. He's just sort of, he's sort of guilt tripping her and uh, he's, very, he's being very childish about it. But sometimes you can't help that, you know. I mean, there are things that happen and... Um, you sometimes it's outside of you. It's it's more driven by emotion, and with Jeff, there's a lot of emotion that's being brought up by the fact that he is back here with his grandmother. And you know this this woman who barely spent any time with him when he was a kid, and uh, up until the point when his parents died, and he sort of blames her for the death of his parents. Um, Because he knows how, how, how great of a logic smith she is. And, he, you know, and, and that is sort of the, the kid in Jeff, is that he doesn't, you know, I mean, she couldn't have helped, you know, honestly. Not, all, not on her own. But um, he just, he suspects, because he doesn't know a lot about her, he just kind of suspects that maybe there is, you know, maybe she's not as good as everyone seems to think she is. Um, anyways, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I know what's coming up, I love this part, you know, where she's like, where are you going? And, uh, he's like, he has some business to take care of, and he, he promises that he'll be far enough away that they won't be downwind of him. It's, it's a poop joke, yay, for poop humor. <laughs> but it is, it's something that, you know, honestly, I'll be very frank about it, I'll be honest, it's something that does come up when you go hiking, when you when you spend the night in the woods. Um, if it's not one of those one of those really uh, modern sort of um, campsites, you know, where they have the the cabins and stuff. If it, if you're just living in, if you're sleeping in tents, then yeah, that's going to come up. It's going to come up where you know you got to kind of get some distance between you and where you're you and the people that you're with or, you know, wherever your campsite is, you know. Um, yeah. It's a bit shocking the first time you have to, you have to do that. You know, it's, it's different. <laughs> but I'm not going to, you know what, I won't talk about it too much. So, uh, anyways, little transition. 
showing its uh, its night. Um, and honestly, if if uh, if the Rock Eater had been by herself, she probably would have just tracked uh, Sethire all night. She would have just hunted for her all night. But you know, you have Jeff and Amy. Jeff, who's a little bit less experienced as a logic smith. I mean, Raduha could probably keep up with her. Uh, Jeff, not as much, you know, because he's just not, he's not as experienced. And then Amy, who's not a logic smith at all, you can't do that to her. She just, she, she would just, she can't uh, travel for extended periods like that. Um, although she does travel on her own, she's been traveling on her own a lot. Obviously, she doesn't do this kind of traveling because... Jeff met her in a town, which meant that she had been in, you know, she was in that town. Um, so she was very much used to sort of the, the you know, the modern comforts of, of life um, versus roughing it. Uh, and, and Jeff is lost. <laughs> he's, he's lost, he went out too far. And uh, a little sound, and he turns, and yeah got this little uh this guy who's obviously a rune claw with this fist with uh I forget what those things are called I'm I'm sorry um I really I want I want that to be a thing you know where uh stuff that I mentioned you can just kind of look up at the, in the the goblin data book and that's going to be a long time updating but eventually it'll be um up to date with the issues coming out eventually it has to happen at some point I guess it doesn't um so they're noticing that he's been gone for a while. Yeah. And, uh, some, somebody's coming. They can hear, you know, these rune claws running around out there. They don't know that they're rune claws, but they can hear them. The rune, cause the rune claws are very, um, they're not professional. I mean, they're, they're professional in the sense that they are very organized bandits, but they're not professional in the sense that they are not, they're not good at like Raduha and the and the Rock Eater are. They're not good at tracking and things like that, which is how they, you know, stumbled across. Otherwise, they would have seen these guys, you know, um, in their little encampment a long time ago. Uh, so they see him passing in their back background. Um, I'll be honest. In my mind, this scene happened really different, and I guess because in my mind, the series is very animated. So a sequence like this, if you can imagine these little glowing balls, these things, these light sources, somewhere way in the distance of uh, this forest, in this dark, dark forest, and they're sort of floating along, sort of bouncing as they float along. You just see these orbs, these glowing orbs, bouncing slightly as they float through the distance. And that's what what was what I saw in my mind. It was much much creepier than is than is depicted here, but um. And they can tell what's going on. They can see it, and uh, and um, Amy recognizes them as the rune claws, uh, because they were running this town that she was staying in. Um. <laughs> And then we show their little temporary camp. These rune claws, they're, they're set up. Um, I was going to have like a lot more rune claws around, but I realized that it's, it's really unnecessary to show lots and lots of rune claws walking around the encampment. They're not an army. They are just sort of bandits. So you're probably going to get a lot of them sort of relaxing inside. Um, they're in the mine, relaxing, um, if they're not on duty. But everything is sort of makeshift. You know, they sort of threw up, you know, the, the tents, you know, they, they, you know, they threw up sort of these tents to sort of hide, uh, the entrance to this cave. And, uh, and they have their, you know, they have their electrical sources, um, but, you know. Oh, oh, I didn't mean to skip that page, but whatever. You know, not a lot going on there. Um, they're just talking, you know. It's just a lot of talking about, um, 
the people that, you know, the reason why they were out in the woods in the first place was that some people escaped from the mine. Um, and they had to go get them. And uh, apparently somebody escaped that had a pistol. Somebody had a steam pistol with them. Um, which is... I, I don't know why I let, I don't know why that detail is necessary because I never show the people that escape. I, I don't know. It's probably a leftover from a larger story that I don't remember anymore. <laughs> Anyways, um, I just wanted to show you know that uh, I wanted you know like through their conversation talk about the fact that it was hard for the guy who captured Jeff to put him down. You know, Jeff is tough. Um, he's tougher than than most most people his age. Um, and a grown man, it took a while. A grown man with that, with that, that very specific type of glove, that, that glove that's supposed to, it's like a taser. Um, it still took a couple of times to, to, you know, drop Jeff. And I mean, it makes sense. I mean, you think about how, how, how long it took to take down, uh, Jay Mephisto in, uh, issue three, you know, they had to stand there and actually hold it on Jay Mephisto. In order to, to um, and it didn't even knock him out. It just sort of made, he was very, he slumped over and he was sort of half out of it. But, uh, you know, of course it was all a part of his plan. <laughs> I really wish I had focused more on that, that story. Um, but things change. Things changed. And uh, that was one of, that was one of those, that was one of the unfortunate things of, about um, the first few issues of Goblin is, it changed so much. There were three different versions of a story that I was working off of, and um, ideas changed. I scrapped a lot of ideas. I kept a lot of ideas. And then I was really trying to get to the Red Castle story arc instead of sort of dilly-dallying around in this in the early, the early issues where I, I was establishing characters personalities and things like that and um i kind of regret showing not showing that part where you sort of you see that it was all a part of jay mephisto's plan to be captured intentionally be captured so that he could find out where the room claws were were uh where their base was their base of operations was. He needed to. He needed to be there so that he could. He could find out where the order of the S was was at and stuff like that, and then escape so he could come back later <laughs> with with Dolclot. Um, and I regret not showing that part, but those issues back then, uh, one through five, those were really long issues in the first place, and back then, ten pages extra would have killed me. <laughs> Oh man. Um So they're talking about this guy Finnegus and it's the worms. Uh he was fed to the worms. <laughs> um It's like I'm sure you won't fail the master. Uh I messed up on that picture. That picture is so messed up right here. It looks like it's clamped to his skull because I forgot to put the little band that holds it onto the holds the helmet onto the back of his head right there. So dumb. Um, <laughs> but uh, whatever, you know, uh, it happens. That's that's, you know, I'll be honest. Um, I, I say that a lot, but it's it is truthful what I'm saying, you know, because I make I make no buts about being very critical, not only about my my own work, but about uh, a lot of stuff that happens in the art community period you know when, when it comes to character design um some of it's even it, it's stuff that i learned on my own and then some of it's stuff that was repeated later in uh when i went to when i went to art school and stuff and you know you had to take for animation you know you take a lot of character design classes because that's what i wanted to be i wanted to be I, I still want to be uh a storyboard artist and a character designer and some of the things you learn is in, in animation especially uh you have to minimize your character design to some degree because you have to think about the fact that, you know, you, you can't put a lot on these poor people, the animators, you know, who are going to have to animate frame for frame for frame by frame, all of that stuff, you know, so you can't dump 
a lot of details onto a character. I mean, unless unless we're talking about a very, very old and uh, studio with a lot of really highly skilled animators in there, you can't put a lot of detail on a character. You can't have a lot of little things here and there all over that character and a lot of different weird designs all over the character's body and their outfits and things like that and on their face. And You can't do that. You have to take into consideration the fact that, you, that there are a lot of people that are going to be drawing those characters over and over and over and a lot of detail slows down the production and drives up the cost. Um, and I wouldn't say that the same thing crosses over into comics, but in a way the same thing does cross over into comics. When you design characters, when you're designing your characters for a comic, if it's a comic that someone else is doing or even yourself, but when you, when you design those characters, you have to take into consideration the fact that you're going to, in the same sense as animation, you're going to be drawing those characters over and over and over again from numerous angles. And so if your character has a ton of details all over them, a ton of little items and bags and satchels and things hanging off of them and things coming out of their hair and little details all over their face, and you're gonna have to you're going to have to draw that over and over and over. And if that character is a main character or a, a major secondary character, a character who's exposed a lot in the series, you're gonna get tired real fast. You're going to get tired really fast. And, and I see it a lot, you know, where, where a lot of people, um, I'll be honest, on DeviantArt, a place that I spend a lot of time, uh, this art community, where I see a lot of people who are designing characters and they're talking about, oh, you know, when I do my series and uh, when I do my comic series or when I do my animation series. And you look at these characters and you're like, I would never, ever take that job. I would never take that job. And that's what I do. I just look at those characters like, I would never draw that character because it's just way too much detail. And, and so for the most part, I try to, to minimize, you know, the details in my characters, but still make it so that each one is sort of, is, is unique enough, you know, but sometimes there are a few too many details and they're easy to forget. And that was one of those details that I, I, I forgot. Um, a little, a little bitty detail like that can be easily forgotten. And, and so you have to take that sort of thing into a, a consideration when you're designing characters. And that's why, you know, like a character like Jeff is very shape-driven. You know, his, his detail is in the shapes. They're recognizable shapes. I want him to be a recognizable character in the shapes, um, you know, and in the, you know, like some of the colors associated with him uh, are very, you know, recognizable uh, for him. And a lot of the main characters, they're very simplified, you know. Um, and, you know, I guess depending on where you are, you know, depending on what you're used to, you see, you know, those differences. You see sort of a, a, a different take on it, you know, uh, um, like, you know, the difference between Western animation and Eastern animation. Uh, generally, there's a little bit more detail in Eastern animation than Western animation. Um, there's a real graphic sort of approach to design to character design in Western animation um, and it it there's almost I think there's almost a um, for the most part there's almost um, sort of a balance between them when it comes to comics you know Eastern comics and Western comics and I guess even European comics there's sort of this balance across the board you know where they're all fairly detailed you know they're they're fairly detailed but uh, you see a lot of minimalist, you know, minimal design uh, um, characters in the West. You know, certainly more than you would see in the East. Um, and there is there are some major differences, though, in the way that comics are done. You know, a lot of comics in the East are not done by one person; they're done by a, a small team. Um, a lot of comic artists there or they, they have um, assistants, you know? Um, you know, they have, you know, assistants that do backgrounds, they have ink assistants, you know, they have, they have different assistants that help them along the way because of the work process, their work process for most uh, manga artists, it's very intense, you know, like several days uh, without 
much sleep, you know, with only like maybe three or four hours sleep. You know, they work very long hours uh, because the books are weekly. Their, their books come out weekly. Um, and, you know, well, yeah, the, I can say the books, but, you know, usually it's chapters within a, an, a, an anthology type situation. But um, still, they come out weekly, and so they have a very intense schedule. And in order to, to maintain that schedule, they have to have assistance. Whereas here in the West, it's usually done by a single artist, um, mostly. I mean, and, you know, you have your inkers and your pencilers. You have a difference there, and then the colorist. But uh, still, you know, you, you have usually a single penciler, a single inker. Most times, there are exceptions. But um, even so... Uh, it, it has, it has sort of, um, it's reflected in the work. Uh, you do see a lot of, um, when it's a, a higher, a higher grade production, you see more detail. I mean, you think about it, uh, most Western comics come out once a month. Most, not all, but most come out once a month. And because of that, there's a lot of detail in those pages uh, as far as the character designs because they have enough time to pay attention to all the little details. Not every artist pays attention to those details. I certainly read a lot of comics in the 90s, uh, a lot of image comics, and um, some of those guys were known for their detail and they did not keep up with those details from panel to panel. And that's when I started paying attention to that kind of thing. When I was noticing, oh man, his shoulder pouches are missing. What's going on? And it's like, what the, why did they do that? And I wasn't sure if it was a mistake or if it was deliberately done. And there was no, there was nothing in the story that told you why it was done. And uh, I realized it was just, it was a matter of, it's hard to keep up with those details. And then I realized it when I tried to emulate those same kinds of things in my artwork. Anyways, um, and you see a lot of detail in Eastern comics, but you have to take into account there are also assistants there and it's just it's it's the difference between you know east and west and you know uh the way that they work and the way that those books come out and i don't really have a, a i'm not really going anywhere with this particular uh tangent and so i just i just kind of want to just stop talking about it um it's just it's it's a little different but i wanted to make make it known that those differences are they come with a source there's a reason why there's differences in character design why people you should you should really pay attention to character design and uh what works what doesn't work um because i i know there's a tendency to get sort of uh over excited i guess about character design you know you have a lot of really great ideas and you want to attribute them all to one character instead of spreading them out over numerous characters just go ahead and create a, an entire rogue you know not rogues gallery but an entire gallery of characters and you know if you have a bunch of designs you know for clothing and 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 little uh accessories and things like that and different things you want to do with the hair and the faces and you know they have tattoos or makeup or you know different things attribute it to different a lot of different characters and not just one character don't don't uh uh load up one character with a lot of detail um because it's going to be it's going to be a pain in the butt <laughs> to uh work with that character consistently and make it you know consistent you know um yeah uh and it's it's something that's learned by everyone really i guess um and it's one of those things that sort of separates uh it, it's it sounds really harsh but it, it is a uh calling of the herd really it really is it comes down to a calling of the herd uh that sounds really cutthroat kind of kind of sounds really you know really mean but it is it is a culling of the hurt because not every artist is meant to be a creator to such an extent you know some of us are just designers you know we're character designers we're writers and then you know you have people that can actually sit down and do the comic book work they can actually do the pages and keep up with those characters and all the you know and the little not I, yeah all the details um whether they're extreme or not um they can keep up with that from panel to panel to panel um, not everyone can do that, and certainly, even even over like 20 years, there are still you know like someone who's been drawing for 20 years or 25 years, 30 years. 
there are still people that drawing that long still can't quite do it at a, a, a fast enough pace. And that is sort of that culling of the herd, you know. There can only be so many that can get to that point. And, um, and it's just kind of knowing your limitations, knowing what you're good at, knowing where your strengths are, your weaknesses, and sort of playing to your strengths. And not ignoring your weaknesses, but still, you know, you recognize your weaknesses and you work on them. You always work on your weaknesses, but you definitely play to your strengths. And if your strength is not tr good character design, then you know don't don't focus so much so much attention on design. Don't focus on all those details. You know, just you know focus on the things that you're strong at. And and sort of if you want your character to be stand out, then maybe focus on their personality. Maybe in the story, their personality is what makes them memorable. And I mean, and you can, and there are simple ways to make a character memorable visually. Color. Have a specific set of colors that are associate with that character regardless. I mean, and that goes back to uh, things that I, I, I don't like talking about things outside of Goblin too much uh, in this, but I'll, I'll be brief about this. I'll try to be brief about this, but one of the things is like um, in, in school, there was a lot of talk from older, sort of older professors who had been a, you know, who had been in you know the animation industry through the eight during the eighties and so they really had this thing uh, for older animation from like uh, you know maybe the sixties and the fifties and the forties and stuff like that and you know there was a lot of and and then some of them were at least well yeah two of them were uh, ex Disney animators and so uh, <laughs> there you know there's there's a real press for uh, consistency, you know, character design consistency. Um, it's called staying on model. And I don't believe in staying on model because I know that staying on model is not necessarily what people, why, why people recognize a character, why they recognize iconography and imagery. Sometimes it comes down to the colors. They recognize color. Um, and it's the same, and I realize that, you know, you watch like old Looney Tunes cartoons and we watch them in class and like one of my professors would criticize some, some uh, directors slash animators who would not stay on model. They do really weird things with some of the Looney Tunes characters. And I really like that, you know, where they wouldn't stay on model because I knew that was still Daffy Duck. Daffy Duck is always Daffy Duck. Mickey Mouse is always Mickey Mouse. Bugs Bunny is always Bugs Bunny. Donald Duck is always Donald Duck. We know them not just because of their design, but we know them because of their colors. The colors that are attached to those characters also define those characters. You know, if you had a black sheet of, you know, I actually want to, I want to, I'm going to talk about this on a, on a different, uh, I'll do it on a, a different sort of commentary video, but I'll talk about it at least. You know, you have a black sheet of paper and it's solid black. If you put a pair of red shorts with little yellow buttons and these two white gloves, we know that's, that's Mickey Mouse. We know that's Mickey Mouse because we recognize those colors. Those colors represent shapes that eventually mold into Mickey Mouse. I mean, Mickey Mouse hasn't always looked the same. He has definitely changed in design over the hundred years that he has existed, I think, at this point. <laughs> has it been a hundred years? No, it's not. It hasn't been a hundred years. It's pretty close, I think, Mickey Mouse has existed. It's pretty close, I think, to a hundred years. I think. I'm not going to get into that. But, um, you know, these characters have existed for a very long time, and none of them have ever stayed the same, you know, because you know, you have to sort of update them, you know, they, they have to be able to adapt, you know, as time goes on. Not necessarily adapt to popular culture, but they have to adapt to contemporary methods of creation. And um, that's what Mickey Mouse did. He, 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 he just, he transformed over time. Uh, the same with Bugs Bunny and Donald Duck, Daffy Duck. These characters sort of morphed over time and they, they changed. And so it's okay um, to go off model and to not pay to pay so much attention to the details in the character you know like all the accessories and all these things you know that represent the character to you because those things may not register with your reader the things that may register with the reader are the personality of the character uh, or um, the colors 
that are associated with the character, especially if that character constantly uh, constantly has the same character. Son Goku and from, the, from the Dragon Ball series. Very recognizable colors. You see those colors and you know who they're attributed to. You do. You really, you know who they're attributed to. And it's because for a good chunk of that character's history, he was associated with those characters. With I mean, with those colors, uh, the character was associated with those colors, um, and and really nothing else. Um, when he was when he was really really young in the series, uh, he he got some different colors before you know he started. Uh, uh, he took up um, his apprenticeship under Master Roshi. Anyways, <laughs> but. Um, you know, it goes it goes beyond that. I just those were the ones that just popped into my head really immediately. Um, but uh, I mean, there's there's tons there's tons of uh, of of things. But that's that's one of those things that I chose to focus on instead of uh, weighing down my characters with lots of details. I decided to focus on a few simple shapes, recognizable shapes, uh, and uh, easy shapes too. You know, they're shapes that I can easily, you know, spit out. You know, boom, boom, boom. I can knock those shapes out really easily. And then colors. Uh, granted, Jeff doesn't always wear, he doesn't always have the same shirt. Uh, so the same colors aren't always associated with him. But there's a familiarity to his color schemes. Um, but then, you know, his skin has, has the same color. His hair always has the same color. And while his hair changes, it certainly changed over the, over the last few issues, you know. Uh, you know, between... Uh, what issue one and issue six there was a change uh still it's it looks sort of the same you know it's there's something familiar to it and, you know he always has those red wristbands um unless i decide to excuse me make them a different color which i do on, on occasion and you know it's one of those things he would change but um you know there's some some things about him visual cues and uh they're color based i try to make them mostly color based so that they're familiar um instead of weighing down the characters with a lot of external details. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, me talking mostly because I know I'm at the end of this issue. <laughs> that was me. I was just rambling because I knew I was at the end of the issue, and I, I hate that these are all like an hour. But, you know, whatever. I have a lot that I want to talk about, you know. Um, and these issues, actually, they, they, bring, in, they bring up these, these ideas. And I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, Anyone that's that's watching these and, or listening to them um, is, you know, they find it also interesting. I hope um, maybe they do, maybe they don't. Uh, maybe they wish I wouldn't talk so long. I'm very long-winded. I can't help it. I and I go off on tangents and I try to find my way back to uh, where I started. <laughs> and I don't do a lot of editing. I do have the ability to edit now, but I honestly I don't edit a lot. I I don't because it's not necessary to edit. I want you to hear, you know, the raw thought process, you know, what, where, you know, wh where it came from at the time I was looking at this and I was thinking about that. So I don't do any of that, you know, where it's, I, I, I type up a script and I read it and record it or I overlay it to the to, uh, video audio overlay. I don't do all that. That's just, I don't like that. It, it feels, um, it feels fake to me. So this is technically live, you know, I'm recording this as I'm speaking and seeing this, uh, and um, I think it, it just makes it a, a, a better experience, you know. Um, not just for, you know, for you guys, but for me. Um, because if I had to read from a script, I'd be so bored, and it would be such a dry read. <laughs> and you wouldn't get a lot of these tangents. You wouldn't get a lot of this extra information because I'd be very clinical about it. I'd be very specific. I'd, I'd focus on on very few things and I mean yeah they'd be like 30 minutes you know but they'd be kind of boring um, so anyways we're at the hour mark and so I'm going to uh, end this and hopefully I will see you uh, see you <laughs> hopefully you'll join me on the next commentary and um, I hope that you enjoyed this one and I, I hope some of the advice that I gave you know I, I, I talked a lot about character design in there um, hopefully some of that, you know, will help. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for listening and watching, and uh, bye.